Uh, good midday, or for some of you, good morning. Uh, my name is Neil Kirshner. I'm a senior associate with the American College of Physicians. It's my pleasure to uh, moderate this webinar being brought to you by the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative, titled Behavioral Health Integration in the Medical Home, an overview of the Massachusetts Self-Assessment and Online Toolkit. This webinar is also sponsored by the PCPCC's Behavioral Health Special Interest Group. Before we begin this exciting uh, webinar, I, I have some announcements that I am, have been asked to make. Uh, one is a, a personal comment that it's just very exciting uh, seeing all the activity, particularly in the last several years, working towards better integrating behavioral health care into the larger health care arena. And so I'm very excited about the webinar. In terms of more official announcements, the PCPCC will be releasing a new case study over the next few days that will feature health information technology innovations for integrating behavioral health care into the patient-centered medical home. In addition, the next national briefing is July 30th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And um, there's an exclamation point here on my copy. It says it's free to the public. And it's titled The Colorado Experiment, Primary Care and Behavioral Health. And registration details are on the PCPCC's uh, website. Uh, I want to uh, make you aware of the upcoming fall PCPCC conference, which will be held on October 13th through 15th in a new location in Bethesda, Maryland. That's just outside um, the downtown DC area, and registration details are also on the website. In terms of questions, I understand that we may have upwards of 300 people on this webinar, so we, we, we will have to use uh, uh, this particular way. Uh, on your uh, screens, you will see a, uh, a box in which you can write questions and send them. Uh, I will read the questions and provide them to our speakers. Our speakers today are Megan Burns and, uh, Mullins, uh, and Daniel Mullen. Uh, Megan is a senior consultant with the Baylor Health Purchasing, uh, where she works on design and implementation of value-based purchasing strategies. And, and Dan is an assistant professor in the Center for Integrated Primary Care in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Um, these will not be separate presentations. It will be a combined presentation. Uh, and with that said, um, Megan and Dan, carry on. Great. Thanks, Neil. Um, as Neil mentioned, I'm Megan Burns. I'm with Baylet Health Purchasing. Baylet Health is a small consulting firm that specializes in working with public agencies and private purchasers to expand coverage and improve health care system performance. We supported the Massachusetts Patient-Centered Medical Home Initiative, and out of that initiative came the Behavioral Health Integration Toolkit that Dan and I will be talking with, um, with you about today. I want to first apologize for the pop-up screen that's going to keep showing up as some sort of computer system performance. Um, I will try to address it as quickly as possible. In the meantime, uh, joining me in presenting our work is Dan Mullen. Um, Dan, would you like to talk a little bit about the Center for Integrated Primary Care and uh, the Berry Family Health Center? Yeah, hi, thanks, Megan. Um, so uh, as, as folks have said, I'm a, I'm a psychologist and assistant professor here at UMass. Uh, my work is in the Department of Family Medicine. Uh, I have a clinical and teaching practice in our rural health center, which is a residency clinic in Barrie, Massachusetts, which is uh, really in, just about in the center of uh, Massachusetts, um, and also do a lot of work with our Center for Integrated Primary Care uh, that Sandy Blunt is uh, founded and uh, directing. Uh, we do a lot of work in um, workforce development for uh, integrated care and uh, supporting uh, other practices going through uh, practice transformation, working uh, to integrate uh, primary care and behavioral health services. Uh, I think Great. that's probably enough. I'll, I'll pass that back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. So in this webinar today, we're going to talk about the Massachusetts Patient-Centered Medical Home Initiative, how we developed a model for behavioral health integration, how we turned our model into a practice self-assessment, 
how we created and implemented a toolkit to help practices work toward the fullest extent of integration possible for their particular practice, and of course, some of our lessons learned and our plans going forward. First, I want to talk a little bit about the background of the Massachusetts Patient-Centered Medical Home Initiative. The PCMHI is a three-year multi-payer demonstration project that started in March 2011. It's a statewide initiative that's sponsored by the Executive Office of Health and Human Services. We had 45 practices across the Commonwealth join us, um, and they range from large academic medical practices in urban areas to small independent practices in suburban and rural areas. The clinical model for PCMHI is similar to that of other PCMH initiatives in that the focus is population health through care management. The initiative is also committed to integrating behavioral health into the primary care setting. Um, there's also a new emerging payment model that will expand upon the patient-centered medical home, and we'll discuss that at the end of the presentation in our next steps. Lastly, I just want to note that the Secretary of Health and Human Services in Massachusetts set a goal that all primary care practices in Massachusetts will be patient-centered medical home initiative, patient-centered medical homes by 2015. This initiative and the technical assistance that's being provided to practices will help the practices in Massachusetts achieve that. So we convened a work group of experts from across the state, um, and that work group included staff from EOHHS agencies, including the Department of Mental Health, the Department of Public Health, Bureau of Substance Abuse Services. It also included three health plans, six outpatient behavioral health providers, four medical home practices, two patient, uh, patient and consumer advocates, and faculty from the UMass Medical School. And together, this group um, developed a model of integration, first by researching different models of integration, and we also conducted a survey of all the patient-centered medical home practices to identify what models of integration were currently in use. As a result of that survey, we found that the extent of variation varied by practice, excuse me, the extent of integration varied by practice. Some practices were co-located and had access to a behavioral health provider who was nearby, perhaps in the same building, but were, was not fully integrated into the practice. Other practices were completely not integrated and had, had trouble identifying behavioral health providers in the community. Uh, lastly, we did have some more advanced practices, if you will, um, who had been working toward full integration for a number of years. Knowing that the extent of variation um, varied by, the extent of integration varied by practice, the Behavioral Health Workgroup set out to create a couple of different strategies or tools that would help practices improve their level of integration regardless of where they began. As a result of that, of, of that effort, um, we created the toolkit, and we'll show you a little bit more about the toolkit later in the presentation. With the research into existing models of integration and some knowledge about our own practices, we defined 39 different elements of integration. Each element represents one piece of the integration puzzle and collectively represents the characteristics of a fully integrated practice. Each element of integration is applicable to all practices regardless of size, population, or integration status. And we took careful attention to make sure that that was the case so that each practice could achieve um, the model of integration that we set forth um, without feeling that perhaps because they were co-located or didn't have a behavioral health provider on site, they couldn't actually be an integrated practice. Then lastly, each of the elements of integration that we uh, identified were then fleshed out in the toolkit um, to um, include strategies that specify concrete and operational steps that a practice might achieve um, to, uh, might take to achieve the elements of integration. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the elements of integration to make it a little clearer. Um, they were organized into five overarching domains, and those are listed here on this slide. The relationship and communication practice domain um, is really about the relationship between the primary care practice and the behavioral health provider and their ability to effectively communicate with each other. The patient care and population impact domain focused on practices use of, uh, of evidence-based screening tools and behavioral health techniques in the care of their patients. Community integration is really about the referral to and connection with community-based behavior health resources and even non-behavior health resources that are community-based resources that can help practices, excuse me, that can help patients um, with their health care. 
care management practices focus on the use of integrated treatment plans. And then the clinic system integration domain was the, um, was the alignment of, of systems and processes to support behavioral health integration. Within each of those domains, there were some foundational elements of integration, or in other words, building blocks of integration. And we recommended that practices focus on achieving those foundational elements before moving on to non-foundational elements. Here's just a selection of some of the foundational and non-foundational elements of integration categorized into the five domains. I want to give you two different examples um, uh, so that it can um, sort of solidify what we're talking about. In the relationship and communication practice domain, which is the first column on the left, triaged access at emergent, urgent, and routine times is a foundational element of integration. And we defined that as um, ensuring that the PCP and behavioral health provider had a reliable positive working relationship and regular communication exchange so that patients could access behavioral health services when they need them based on acuity. Then we developed strategies that we'll show you in the live version of our toolkit um, for practices to meet that. Another example um, in the patient care and population impact domain, which is the second column from the left, is supporting uh, health behavior change. This is a non-foundational element of integration, and it means that patients could be considered for referral to behavioral health providers for support with lifestyle changes and management of medical problems such as obesity, diabetes, or chronic illnesses. Non-foundational elements of, in of integration aren't necessarily uh, secondary, um, but they aren't the essential building blocks. Um, and we wanted practices to focus on the essential building blocks before they moved on um, to other elements of integration. So we took those 39 elements of integration and turned them into a practice self-assessment that we administered through SurveyMonkey. I do want to acknowledge that uh, we got the inspiration for a self-assessment from the Maine Health Access Foundation. Um, they created a self-assessment that we had uh, reviewed, and it prompted us to um, think about that as a concept for our idea as well. So thank you um, to those of you who may be listening from the Maine Health Access Foundation. The goals of the self-assessment were to assist practices in identifying gaps in integration and to help the practices identify potential opportunities for improvement. We hoped that the practices would take the self-assessment in a team setting and use it as a tool for discussion while they're identifying what their gaps in practice uh, are. When we administered this for the first time, we had a 96% response rate, uh, which we were very excited about. Um, I'd like to invite Dan to share um, his practice's experience in taking the self-assessment um, and how he sat down with his team and identified opportunities for improvement. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Um, so I had the privilege of being on the task force that helped uh, uh, put this uh, self-assessment together and then also working in one of the uh, 45 practices uh, in the initiative uh, that was asked to complete it. So I got to see this sort of from the top and the bottom. Um, so the way that we did it in the practice where I work is uh, um, in the initiative, every practice was asked to identify a leadership team. Um, and in most cases, if that practice had uh, a behavioral health clinician that worked in the practice, they included that person in their, in their leadership team meetings. And so for us to complete the assessment, we, um, it, uh, like Megan said, it was done over SurveyMonkey. Uh, we just went to our conference room with a projector, sat down as a leadership team, and went through the survey together and sort of hashed out what the responses were. And I think, you know, this is uh, an interesting aspect of the process. We, we were asking each practice to complete the survey once. Uh, and so what that meant was we had to sort of come up with, a, with an answer. And um, in some cases, you know, the director of nursing or the medical director or myself as, as uh, the behavioral health clinician had, uh, you know, different perspectives on how we might answer one of the questions. And it was even the process of taking the assessment itself was a little bit of an intervention uh, because it, it sort of highlighted, uh, you know, the different perspectives that we had about how we approached integration. And I think just going through it uh, helped get us all on the same page about exactly what are our policies, you know, what is our vision uh, for integration. Uh, and uh, I, my sense is, in talking to other practices, um, 
that most of them completed it in this group format, although not all of them did. Um, in fact, there may have been at least one case where two separate people completed the assessment. Um, I, I think maybe they, they didn't do a good job of coordinating who was going to do it. And we were able to see that, you know, even within a practice, there might be a little bit of disagreement about how you would respond to some of these questions. So. Thanks, Dan. So um, with the self-assessment, we took those results to identify um, some of the gaps in um, opportunities that our entire initiative had, and that helped us really define some of our technical assistance going forward. Um, I want to pause and just note some of the technical assistance we provided aside from this toolkit, which was our major um, piece of technical assistance. But we also had um, uh, learning sessions that covered a range of topics, including behavior health integration, although not always behavior health integration. We did have one day devoted specifically to behavior health integration. And we had some webinars, um, and, um, and we've trained our medical home facilitators who were individuals who helped the practices uh, work, toward inter um, work toward becoming a patient-centered medical home. Um, so, um, so these survey results were very helpful for us to identify some of the different um, weaknesses or opportunities for improvement that um, we could um, design some technical assistance around. Some of our strengths, I do want to know, I don't want to go into this in into great detail, but I do want to note that we had a number of strengths around, um, around comfort of uh, PCPs requesting advice from behavioral health providers, around linkages between community resources and PCPs. I do want to specifically note, however, that uh, we had five domains of integration, and the fifth domain, the clinic system integration, we didn't have many strengths. Um, uh, to display, actually we had none. And part of that is because um, that is probably the most difficult to domain of integration. It's really about having integrated e-record systems, um, open access in some of the more advanced, if you will, um, elements of integration. So I want to go specifically into two different survey results. Um, we'll connect this back into the toolkit in just a moment. So what we found is that 70% of the practices um, aren't screening on a routine basis for depression and alcohol. And that we thought was a foundational element of integration. And so we, um, at the time that we took this self-assessment or administered the self-assessment, we had not completed the toolkit. So we spent extra time and detail in these particular areas. As you can see some practices were never doing it. Um, and we would hope that more were doing it on a routine basis than on a on a sometimes basis, if you will. In the care, care manager uh, domain, we had even greater concern, and that is um, that we didn't have effectively co uh, coordinated integrated treatment plans. Part of the reason was um, in order to become part of the patient center medical home initiative, within a certain period of time after launch, practices hire, had to have a, a nurse clinical care manager hired. And there was a lot of uh, time and attention and uh, training focused on the clinical care manager that didn't include sort of an integrated treatment plan. And at the time of the self-assessment, um, practices were still onboarding their clinical care manager. And so I have a feeling that that's why, to some extent, um, the results of the clinical care manager um, uh, performing an integrated treatment plan were not as high as we um, hoped. So before we go and uh, review the toolkit, I want to talk a little bit about how we implemented it. We launched it in um, April of 2013. And at first, the um, initial use was minimal. So we ended up training our medical home facilitators to assist the practices and act as promoters. Um, and Dan joined me with the medical home facilitators in having weekly 30-minute huddles. And Dan, do you want to talk a little bit about how um, that was helpful to the medical home facilitators and the types of um, resources that you and I provided to them um, to uh, assist the practices with using the toolkit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I think I see um, the role of the medical home facilitators in this project as really being key to, to the success, probably more than any other aspect of the project. Um, they were going to these practices regularly, building relationships with their leadership team and the pilot teams. Um, and I think we finally got some, some traction in using the toolkit when we included the facilitators and helped increase their expertise in the toolkit. Um, but most of them, I don't. I think it would be fair to say, wouldn't identify themselves as expert in uh, behavioral health integration. And so, uh, Megan initiated these regular phone calls that uh, included myself, um, so that we could um, answer any questions they had about the toolkit. So, for example, a practice might say, "We want to do more routine screening for depression and come up with a way to respond when people screen positive," but the practices have you know some questions now it could be something simple like what's the best way to do this should they screen the patients in the waiting room or in the exam room or how do we reassure medical assistants about um, giving these questionnaires to people when we might be asking about uh, suicidal thoughts so really sort of practical information um, they were able to, to come back to these meetings ask these questions and uh, I could help give them some answers and suggest some approaches to solving the problems that they, they could then take back to the practices. So I think uh, I think that that's really a big lesson learned I think from this uh, using this toolkit was um, including the medical home facilitators made a, a really big difference I think in terms of its uptake and uh, answering any questions that came up as practices went through the toolkit. Yeah and I also want to note that um, this also helped us refine some of the content in the toolkit and expand upon it. So one example is a medical home facilitator said, my practice is ready to go with behavioral health integration. They want to hire a social worker, but have no idea how to do it. And um, Dan dug through some of his files and talked to some of his colleagues and found examples of um, job descriptions for social workers. And I talked with um, the um, Massachusetts chapter of the National Association for Social Workers and found out how um, social workers are typically hired by practices, what kind of publications to announce jobs in, and we put some of that information into the toolkit as well as giving that practical advice to the medical home facilitators to pass on to the practices. So it helped us refine some of the content and understand what some of the issues were, and I think it was a, a, a helpful um, uh, time period for us. So um, let me um, go to navigate to the toolkit so you can see exactly what we're talking about because we find this to be very exciting. Um, I want to note that currently um, the toolkit is not available publicly but will be, I think, within the next couple of days to weeks. Um, and um, we, I don't think we'll be able to email all of the attendees on this list, but I would recommend that um, you perhaps, um, if you'd like to see this live, um, and review it on your own time to check out the um, Executive Office of, of Health and Human Service Agency website in Massachusetts and you should be able to find it there. Um, if not, Dan and I have our email addresses at the end of the presentation and you can email us if you're interested in looking at it. So I want to give you a little bit of overview of the, of the toolkit, um, how we put it together, and then I'm going to ask Dan to talk a little bit more detail of the strategies. I realize that once we get into some of the text, you're not going to be able to read the text in great detail, um, and that's okay. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about it, but it's really to show um, some of the concepts and the overall view of this. So um, we, uh, that self-assessment that we've been talking about, we uploaded a version here for practices um, who perhaps might not have taken it or would like to retake it um, with instructions to do so. What we also did, um, which may be very hard to see here, is that we included an average score um, so that practices can know how they compare. We debated about that for a very long time because there was some concern about comparing practices um, and, and, and making this more about themselves, but practices really wanted to see how they fared against others. So um, practices who are define themselves as non-co-located, co-located, or pediatric can come here and take the first step to this toolkit, and that is taking the self-assessment, identifying your domain of focus, and then identifying your element of focus that you'd like to begin to work on. 
So um, the domains, as I mentioned here before, there are five of them. They all are listed here. And within each of those domains are the elements of integration. I want to show a couple in particular. Um, I mentioned our um, need to focus on routine screening for depression and alcohol. And so here we have um, noted that it is a foundational element of integration. We've defined it for the practices. And then we have some step-by-step -step operational strategies um, that can help practices uh, begin to do this on a routine basis. Hopefully, um, by expanding the screen, you can see a little bit more detail. Um, part of the strategies, we try to um, also incorporate outside sources, um, make this sort of a go-to place to find what you need. So for example, um, patient, uh, practices may not have known where to find the PHQ-2 or 9 um, in any language that they need. Um, so we've included um, links. Uh, this would take you right to a common website that many of you have probably seen where you can get a printable version of PHQ screeners. Uh, we did that for the um, audit as well. Dan will talk a little bit about this one-page uh, patient stress questionnaire that his practice developed that we included in the toolkit. We also have very detailed um, information, so um, uh, greater details of uh, toolkits that we didn't think needed to be directly in our toolkit because we were trying to stay at a very high level, very operational, very concrete level um, without um, confusing too much. In addition to the strategies, or as part of the strategies, um, here's a great example of how we try to make this concrete um, and operational. So for practices who are trying to implement um, routine screening for depression and alcohol, we recommended sample text or sample scripts um, for their staff to use when administering it. So if they were going to verbally administer it and sit down with a patient, here are some questions related to to your health that your provider asks every patient and would like you to answer. Um, and we thought that those would be helpful so that um, there can be some sort of um, uh, routinization of implementing these screens. This scripting is not in all um, elements of integration, but in quite a few. In addition, um, where we could, we included videos, and so uh, practice could hit uh, play here and watch um, an example between a provider and a patient um, going through the PHQ-9, asking the questions, hearing example um, answers from patients, as well as um, a medical assistant or nurse administering the audit. So we really tried to be very practical and concrete, as I mentioned before. And then for those, um, perhaps the administrators, not necessarily the clinical care managers, but uh, maybe there are folks who wanted to get into further detail um, to learn some of the evidence behind it, and we've included all those resources um, in this toolkit as well. I want to note that we connected um, a lot of the elements of integration, and so um, I'll give an example of how um, we thought it would be important that if you are going to begin screening for depression and alcohol, that you also develop integrated clinical pathways uh, for those with um, alcohol use um, um, issues or with depression. So again, um, here is an example of some strategies where we're recommending brief negotiated interviews for um, unhealthy substance use um, as well as for depression. Um, and again, uh, some example in, uh, videos um, that practices can use to see what brief negotiated interview actually looks like um, in real life. I also want to show you um, the care manager domain. Again, as you saw, um, creating um, integrated clinical care management um, treatment plans was a challenge. And so um, here is a great example of how we really tried to make an effort to connect the larger medical home initiative resources and technical assistance and training that was happening with the behavioral health integration. We firmly, the behavioral health integration work group, firmly believe that we were not to be uh, sort of an outsider or an extra step, that we were to be um, fully integrated within our own initiative. And one step in doing that is by using the same sorts of, of visuals, the same sorts of, um, of, um, of planning, for example, here, this continuum of care was used in the care manager training, so this would be familiar to them 
and we would translate this into how it relates to behavioral health integration in particular. And so that's just an example of how we try to be as seamless as possible um, with the um, technical assistance we were already providing. Um, so there is a lot here, um, and it can be a little bit overwhelming the way it's organized, but if the practices take that self-assessment, identify their opportunities for improvement, they can go directly to any of these elements of integration and get some ideas. Dan, do you want to talk a little bit about how your practices use this? I also want to note that Dan's practice helped um, create some of these strategies, and so um, he'll talk about um, how they were used prior to the toolkit, and in some cases in the toolkit. So I'll turn yeah. it over to you and um, and help you navigate here. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, I think it's worth saying that um, I, th I think it's reasonable to say that the practice that I'm in uh, was perhaps a little bit further along in the process of integrating than some of the others in the project. Um, but that said, there were definitely areas uh, we identified in the self-assessment where uh, we were uh, we could think about improving. Um, so just want to go through some of those areas that uh, we talked about. Um, one of them is uh, the smooth handoff. And so uh, because we have a number of co-located um, and integrated behavioral health providers in the practice, uh, we wanted to make sure that all of our primary care providers um, had a sense of the best way to introduce the role of a behavioral health consultant to a patient who might benefit uh, from meeting with them. Uh, and when we went through this, one of the things we recognized is, boy, we do a really good job uh, of focusing on that for our residents uh, as part of their education in learning to be family physicians. But we really have uh, neglected to go back and see if any of the attending physicians uh, have thought about this. Uh, and so it was an opportunity to take some dedicated teaching time, uh, some conference time uh, where those uh, attendings would be, uh, and talk about this and go through and even demonstrate um, some of these introductions. Um, so uh, I think if, if you could scroll down a little bit, uh, Megan. You know, there, again, we tried to provide some concrete examples in here about language that people uh, might want to use in making these introductions, just ways of uh, thinking through these things that would make it a uh, meeting with a psychologist or a social worker uh, a little more palatable. So talking about stress and how uh, physical health may be impacted by stress and the behavioral health consultant is someone who might be able to help the patient with stress. You know, framing these things as stress rather than an anxiety disorder or, um, you know, a psychiatric illness uh, is, is the kind of language that's going to make it a, a little easier for a patient to be open-minded about meeting with a behavioral health provider. And, and this page here sort of talks about those issues and it was something we had to remind ourselves uh, to go back and, and talk about with uh, not just our doctors but also um, the nurses uh, and medical assistants in our practice. Uh, can we take a look at uh, 2.3 now? I think uh, I may have already um, talked a little bit about this, but um, we really wanted to emphasize uh, that to become you know, fully integrated, you really need to work hard to increase the accessibility of your behavior, behavioral health providers. Uh, so here we try to talk about um, uh, approaches to doing that. Um, you know, one of the greatest cultural shifts of moving a behavioral health provider into primary care is um, getting them used to the idea that their uh, sessions with patients might be interrupted, um, that uh, encouraging people to knock on the door or to phone into an exam room uh, in order to, to include, the, uh, include the behavioral health provider in a warm handoff. Uh, so we wanted to spend some time talking about that and talking about other ways uh, that you could increase curbside uh, handoffs. So uh, trying to set up scheduling templates uh, so that your behavioral health provider can be uh, more readily available, um, keeping paperwork uh, burdens to a minimum, being very short and clear about um, what the reason is that a patient needs to meet with a behavioral health provider. Those are some of the strategies here. Um, and I would say one of the things we constantly struggle with in my practice and a lot of practices is how do you balance um, making your behavioral health providers accessible 
uh, so that they can get people in at the same day and be available for curbside handoffs while simultaneously making sure that they're clinically productive um, to the degree that uh, we're all still living in an RVU world uh, your behavioral health providers do have to be meeting with patients uh, for billable time. Um, and so for our practice, it, it gave us an opportunity to take a look at the way our scheduling templates were working um, and looking for opportunities uh, to uh, make sure that the behavioral health provider's door was open or that they were available at key times uh, when primary care providers might be looking for them. Uh, so that, yeah. Dan, um, I just want to note um, that one of the things that we tried to do here as part of this toolkit is ensure that all of the strategies could be applicable, applicable to all the different practices. And I think what Dan was mentioning here, which is a little bit subtle, is that they took these ideas and then expanded upon them. There was um, no way that we could um, go into the heads of each practice, if you will, and figure out what their particular issues are. And so we hoped this would get their creative juices flowing and and provide them with some step-by-step -step ideas that they could then expand upon. And to the extent that certain practices were able to test these strategies, and in some cases we borrowed these strategies right from Dan's practice, in other cases we borrowed a lot of strategies from outside uh, groups, including the Cherokee Health System. Um, and so um, it's sort of a mix between having, um, it, it was sort of a balance, I should say, between having real life practical examples um, and getting practices to begin to think about how they can expand upon some of these issues and what it causes them to think about. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It probably connects back to what we were talking about earlier with the medical home facilitators. That um, I, I think what we're finding is that you know the the toolkit isn't is is not sufficient, but it's an important step in helping practice integrate that um, in, in some cases it may raise as many questions as it answers, but that, that might not necessarily be a shortcoming of it because um, you know integration is not a cookie cutter process that you can just take and impose on a practice. It really needs to uh, match up with the uh, individual needs of that practices, the assets that, that they have or the things that they don't have and, and be realistic about what those things are. Um, so I, I would definitely agree with that point. Um, let's, let's take a, a look at 2.4 um, training activities. You know, um, again, this, this toolkit is embedded in a much larger patient-centered medical home initiative. And one of the things that, that 2.4 really reminded us uh, was to think about um, the role of behavioral health integration is not just being about mental health. Um, practices in this initiative were being asked to focus on chronic diseases, um, either as part of their application to NCQA for recognition. They're picking, uh, you know, they're picking um, traditionally medically focused conditions like diabetes or hypertension to develop um, uh, disease management programs for, but this. This item 2.4 really reminded us, wow, this is a place where um, behavioral health clinicians can really have a role in talking about health behavior change, in talking about the role of um, behavior change related to adherence to treatment plans, in terms of just engaging patients to make treatment plans. Um, and so one of the things that this reminded, of, reminded us of was to, to be looking for opportunities to think about behavioral health integration for every aspect of, of, the, um, of the practice redesign that we were going through, not just the aspects that were, you know, obviously related to, to behavioral health, like depression, for example. Uh, so if you could scroll down, scroll down a little bit. Um, sure. Before, yeah. While I scroll down, I just want to note here as well, as you can see, here are some strategies for all practices here are strategies specific to co-located and integrated practices, and right. then here are strategies specific for non-co-located practices. Right. And, and so... How far do you want me to go down? No, that, that's good right there. I mean, when we talk about uh, encouraging training um, for, for everyone on the, uh, in the health center, um, this is really something that, if I'm being perfectly frank, um, we, we continue need to, to do better at in our practice. And, and actually just watching this today uh, in, in, 
in leading this presentation is reminding me of this is um, and so many times we do a great job of uh, engaging the physicians or um, nurse practitioners or physician assistants in these training uh, in these trainings that we offer but continuing to look for ways to engage the medical assistants and the nurses in our practice is important um, you know in thinking through this idea of how to help everyone practice to the limits of their license um, I think putting putting this training activities uh, section this 2.4 in there is really a reminder that the the behavioral health consultants role isn't just to the patients it's it's also to serve as a consultant on behavioral issues to all of the providers on the practice um, and I think for for us thinking about that has been helpful uh, let's go to 3.1 um, so what I want to highlight on this page is a, a combined uh, patient stress questionnaire and parts of this will be um, very familiar to a number of you. Um, I think we've actually even updated it a little bit more since this version, but essentially this includes the PHQ-9 uh, in a slightly modified format uh, for screening for depression. Uh, and below that I believe is the GAD-7 screening for uh, anxiety disorders. Um, on the back of the, the same page uh, is a quick assessment about physical pain uh, and then the four item PTSD screener uh, followed by the 10 item uh, audit screening for uh, problematic alcohol use. Um, and we realize this is a lot of behavioral health screening um, but uh, we were able to get buy-in in our practice to slowly roll this out. And I think connecting back to my last point, um, the way that we did that was early in the project, um, we were focused on patients with diabetes and it was easy to get consensus amongst all the providers that uh, we ought to be screening all of our patients with diabetes for depression. And so then it was a, a matter of building the workflows uh, to make it possible that the, the medical assistants were routinely screening uh, everyone with diabetes for uh, with, with this questionnaire. Um, and once we had those workflows developed, it was then easy to roll them out to all adults uh, once everyone became comfortable with the process of screening and to say, you know what, um, we're not going to just screen people with diabetes. We want to make sure that all adults are being screened annually uh, for problematic alcohol use um, and depression, uh, those being sort of two conditions for which there's a lot of evidence for annual screening. And then uh, I think because of our providers' experience, um, they felt that screening for PTSD and anxiety disorders was also worthwhile uh, to help them make decisions uh, about uh, helping their patients. Um, so what this uh, routine screening tab offers uh, is sort of giving practices a number of different instruments that they could think about using in the process of uh, developing uh, screening workflows. Um, and, and I guess I would just really highlight that is initially it's really um, about redefining the roles of the participants in the practice and so getting medical assistants and nurses used to the idea of screening uh, being involved in the screening getting physicians comfortable with um, asking these questions and reassuring them that hey if you find somebody who uh, really has a lot of unmet behavioral health needs we have the staff available to respond to that it won't just all fall to you um, so I think um, I think our practice was was pretty well developed in this area but this is definitely a domain we, we focused on uh, helping all the practices work through and I, I think something that we supported a lot through uh, the in-person learning sessions uh, that the practices in this project completed um, Dan, I just want to note that I just took a quick peek at some of the questions, and one of the questions was about um, the pediatric routine screening. So I want to note that we had a, a very strong pediatric um, uh, pediatric representatives on the behavioral health work group who were um, uh, helped promote um, the idea of having um, separate um, um, strategies for the uh, pediatric practices. We had only, um, I think, six or maybe 10 pediatric practices in total um, and a couple that had um, a couple practices that did see adolescents and, and children um, but it wasn't um, a major focus but you'll see here that we did include all of these which I believe are all um, Ma Ma Massachusetts Medicaid required um, and paid for screenings 
um, here. So we did consider that. We also have the same similar uh, kind of uh, text as well as videos. Uh, this is an administration of the craft with, um, I think, a teenager. Um, so um, Dan, I'll let you keep going, but I just took a quick pick at, uh, peek and saw that. Um, yeah, no, that's great. I mean, that. That, that's important. We, we were always trying to remind ourselves to not forget the, the practices that were focused on pediatrics. Um, let, let's take a glance at 4.5. Um, for a number of years, it had been suggested to us that we needed to do a better of job of including patients in our quality improvement efforts. Um, and I think um, going through this toolkit and this self-assessment was just uh, you know, one more push to really focus in on this issue. Uh, what that meant for our practice was um, forming a patient advisory board uh, that meets um, every <clears throat> every two months and is made up of uh, volunteers from our community uh, who come into the practice uh, uh, to to really to give us input on how we could be, what we ought to be focusing on in quality improvement. So examples of this might be improving our phone system, uh, making more evening appointments available, um, changing around signage in the health center. Um, and with regards to behavioral health integration, um, we, we do have our behavioral health, uh, one of our behavioral health team members attend the, the patient advisory board from time to time to get feedback on issues like, um, well, for example, we recently were running uh, a group for patients uh, who were receiving Suboxone, and we wanted to go to the patient advisory board and hear what their thoughts were about um, opiate dependence in the community and things we could be doing to address that uh, and ways we could be improving our, our care of patients with both chronic pain and those with addiction issues uh, to, to opiates. And, uh, boy, did they have a lot to say uh, about that issue uh, at the Patient Advisory Board. Um, so this is something I'm, I'm proud to say we've been doing a better job of since uh, since completing, uh, uh, since taking a look at this toolkit. Do um, you want to say something about that, Megan? Um, no, I was just going to say that um, uh, the PCMHI, this is another example of how we try to incorporate technical assistance that was already being provided into this particular toolkit. Um, in an easier manner. So, yep, absolutely. And I think just reiterating that making that behavioral health was a part of the practice, and that um, and and making sure that we went to our patients and this advisory board to to get their feedback on uh, behavioral health issues. Probably not surprising to most of you, the patient advisory board was just thrilled that our practice was you know continuing to expand the behavioral health resources that were available. Um, we don't hear patients ever say, boy, you shouldn't be integrating. Um, I, I, you know, we've never heard anything like that. Um, so take a look at 5.2. Um, you know, this is an area of particular interest to me, is training other members of the, of the team to focus on uh, behavioral health skills. Um, and this is tricky because um, it's not easy to, de to design something like a website that can train people to improve their active listening. Certainly some people have, you know, have worked in this area, um, but what, what this page did was remind us that we ought to be um, not just thinking about the behavioral health providers as the ones who need behavioral health skills. Um, in particular for our practice, that's meant a real concerted effort in motivational interviewing, uh, which is a real interest of mine. I have a 20-hour course in motivational interviewing um, and been able to have our clinical care manager take the course uh, and have about, um, I would say about almost well, probably about 40% of our physicians uh, have completed this intensive training. And we've also offered, again, some of the training to nurses and medical assistants who are spending more time with face-to-face uh, -face patient contact. Um, I think uh, this, uh, this page here um, around uh, auto also includes some some uh, discussion of action plans. And um, we really needed to do a better job of uh, focusing on goal setting with patients uh, and giving uh, especially our medical assistants some skills to begin documenting goals uh, with patients with diabetes. And I'd say that, you know, that's something that's an on 
ongoing work for us to do and uh, our behavioral health team has sort of been instrumental in, in helping with that training. Um, I think the, the last one I want to take a look at is 6.9. Um, this sort of ties back into one of the things we talked about earlier, uh, but I want to just spend a little bit more focused time talking about same-day access. Um, we continue to look at um, uh, our capacity of our behavioral health service uh, and continue to try to find ways to provide um, primary care behavioral health services. And I think one of the distinguishing features of primary care behavioral health services is rapid access. Uh, to get away from this idea of requiring patients to wait for an intake appointment, go through an intake, and then wait to be assigned to a clinician. Um, that's a model that, that exists in the specialty mental health centers uh, in our community, uh, but we really don't want to be replicating that model. We, we really want to be providing primary care behavioral health where patients can rapidly access services. And what that's meant recently is we have shifted uh, most of our behavioral health services uh, to an open access model where we're not doing advanced access for appointments where a patient can call and get an appointment with a behavioral health clinician that day or one of the next couple days. We've actually expanded it to be three days out um, because many of our patients who uh, have medical transportation have to be able to give notice to, the, to their ride uh, at three days ahead of time. So we allow those patients to, to get an appointment within uh, a, a three or a, a three day window um, and this um, and and I would say that our decision to move to this op open access model uh, came um, definitely came out of discussions we had uh, prompted by the toolkit uh, in terms of it really continuing to push us uh, to improve our access uh, for patients um, in in tracking the data on that um, what we saw was a ten percent increase in our utilization rate for our behavioral health providers uh, once we moved to the open access model. Um, I, what that accounted for, uh, that came from a really a, a pretty significant decrease in uh, no-shows, but an even larger decrease in last minute cancellations of behavioral health appointments. Um, and we've been really happy with the results. And again, so far the patients uh, have been uh, really happy with the results of this open access uh, model. Um, so. Uh, I see we're at about uh, one o'clock Eastern, and so I think I'll wrap up going through these these items and hand it back to you, uh, Megan, before we open up for questions. Great. Um, thanks a lot, Dan. I think it's really helpful to hear how a practice is actually using the toolkit um, and uh, some of the success you've had using some of the strategies. Um, I want to note that we have had some feedback. We had some great positive remarks about the strategies and tools and the resources for practices to use. We found that some practices were, um, actually one practice um, uh, informed me that they used our entire model of integration as a way of developing a, strate a strategic plan for their own integration. And while as other practices sometimes go into the toolkit, go get that file, that resource, that link to the website they needed um, to continue on with their day, and it, it, they know that it's in a place where they can find it. So there is definitely different use of the toolkit. I will say that um, there has been some concern that the major barriers to integration, like I'm not getting paid for this, I can't talk to behavioral health providers because of privacy rules or perceived per per privacy rules, or I don't have a partnership or I can't find a behavioral health provider. Um, I, um, I'd like Dan to address some of that because we, we couldn't address some of those major things within this toolkit for obvious reasons. We, we weren't changing regulations as part of this, but, um, uh, but Dan, why don't you talk a little bit about how practices can t continue to, to use some of these strategies despite these barriers? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's a pretty predictable um, set of first questions or concerns that come back from some practices or members of some practices when you start to talk about integration. So you get issue, questions about time, you get questions about reimbursement, you get questions about uh, confidentiality. Um, you know, I think I'll, I'll take the... Uh, the um, actually, Megan, can you go back to the toolkit? Uh, do you have that ability? Yep. Um, 
and and go to the one that talks about um, that that addresses the confidentiality that links out to the NCCBH uh, page. Um, You're challenging me to remember this. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm putting you on the spot. Um, how about chart note integration? That'd be my best guess. Yeah, there we are. Here we that, go. Yeah. Guess. Uh, the SAMHSA HRSA Center for Integrated Health Solutions webpage. Um, so this is just you know uh, most of you out there have probably encountered this. You get a lot of concerns ab about confidentiality, most often coming from the providers trained uh, with a mental health background. Uh, so providing this link to be able to answer their questions uh, and reassure them about um, how they can take good care of patients. Um, uh, and be following the law uh, was really uh, an important part of this, um, especially when you get into the areas of substance abuse and, and clarifying uh, what can and cannot be shared uh, there. I think uh, you know throughout the project, what 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 we try to reiterate is um, you know there are really big ethical concerns with not coordinating patients' cares, with not sharing information. Uh, in legally safe, uh, you know, legally permissible ways, and that's a big push behind this uh, effort at integration is uh, trying to help people solve these problems and clarify what a lot of times happens to be misinformation about what can and can't be done. Um, so the other uh, issue that Megan brought up, the the payment issue, um, yeah, uh, that wasn't just confined to the question of behavioral health integration in this uh, uh, patient uh, center medical home initiative. Um, that was also a big part of the care management, uh, uh, the, the limits of what the care managers could do uh, because it was so difficult to find ways to, to get paid for their time. Um, and honestly, in Massachusetts, what, what we see is um, uh, it looks like uh, very shortly there's going to be an acknowledgment here that the you can only move so far in this PCMH uh, process uh, towards integration, towards including care managers without uh, changing the way people get paid. Um, and so uh, what we're hoping is that as those alternative payment strategies come into place uh, and we, we open up this toolkit to, to the public, uh, that people will really be able to move even further along in the process of integration. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the payment model and the next steps. Yeah, uh, and you mentioned one other thing you wanted me to talk about. Uh, I, I did confidentiality and payment. Um, you know, I, I, do you remember what the other thing was? No, I don't. <laughs> okay, so, sorry about that. Um, maybe it'll come up in one of our questions. I, I, yeah, I think the idea is that um, the some practices some practices are at the point where they say well there are too many barriers we can't integrate but I think Dan's point is there's a lot that you can do um, yeah. before you hit some of these barriers and that's what this toolkit is really about yeah absolutely but I think and I, I think and I would add um, once once the, as those barriers begin to be removed there's still a lot of value to this toolkit I think perhaps even more uh, so it, I guess what we're saying is we think it's useful before and after uh, payment reform. Agreed. Okay, so um, uh, just talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we had. So Dan mentioned this a little earlier, our self-assessments, there are some limitations with doing that. Um, he mentioned in one case a practice submitted two different self-assessments from two different folks and they were pretty different um, in terms of their responses. And in other cases, the respondent may not be the, you know, may not represent everybody's experience with integration. Um, and so that can be a challenge, but again, it was really meant to be an exercise. And so those challenges are really causing us to say, how much do we want to take the results of the self-assessment and draw conclusions versus how much do we want to use it as an exercise for practices to identify uh, some of their opportunities for improvement. Um, the, the toolkit took a long time to develop, um, and it was retrofitted into a um, course, a content uh, course management system, which is less than ideal for a tool like this, but I think with the instruction that we've provided both, um, we, we did a, a separate webinar for the practices in our initiative, 
the medical home facilitator training and the instruction that we put on the website, we hope that the navigation can be easy uh, to manage. Um, but I think once you get used to it, you can figure it out. But it can be a little bit of a barrier um, to begin with. Um, not all of the elements had um, evidence-based strategies that were really practical to implement. And um, I just wanted a note here that, um, uh, in something I hadn't mentioned before, the Massachusetts School for Professional Psychology, I'm gratefully indebted for, indebted to, um, they um, commissioned three um, very capable, very bright PhD students to um, do the bulk of the research for identifying these strategies. And then we took those strategies and that research and um, really tried to make them operational and then used um, a consultant from Cherokee Health Systems and a consultant from Cartesian um, Health Solutions to make sure that we were making these very operationally based and realistic because sometimes what's evidence-based in the research isn't necessarily realistic. Um, and, um, and that's how this was developed, but we did find that some of the clinic system integration domain was you just need an e-record, perhaps, um, and some things we couldn't really get around in terms of finding evidence. So that is one of the challenges we had. There were many competing priorities uh, with using this toolkit within the initiative. There were a lot of uh, reporting uh, um, um, requirements that were outside of the behavioral health topic that practices need to do, which is typical of all PCMHI initiatives. There are other things to focus on, and so sometimes it was difficult for us to say, hey, we've got this great resource for you, come use it. And then the lastly, the payment model. Um, the payment model in the Patient Center Medical Home Initiative is not aligned with integration, but there is a new payment model coming out that Dan and I have been alluding to um, that we'll talk about in just a minute before we open up to some questions. So some of the lessons that we've learned now that we've completed this toolkit, I think first and foremost, if behavioral health integration is not part of the priorities at the beginning of a large-scale initiative like this, it's going to be really difficult to play the catch-up and the attention that it, that it really deserves. The Massachusetts Patient Center Medical Home Initiative did not have a separate behavioral health work group or, uh, uh, or focus um, at its launch. And I think that put us behind the eight ball for a period of time, and we had to struggle to make sure that the topic was considered um, seamlessly in all of the different learning sessions. That sort of spins into this next bullet point that we firmly believe that the behavioral health integration is not a separate topic. And so while we did have one day learning session of technical assistance focused on behavioral health integration, we really tried to weave it into all the topics. So the, top, the, the learning session about consumer engagement, um, we wanted to make sure that some of those consumers that came and presented also had experience with uh, receiving behavioral health care within a primary care setting um, so that that could be sort of a, a way that uh, we could seamlessly put these two topics together. Engage leadership at the state um, through the technical assistance providers and at the practice level um, all throughout the initiative is really important for successful transformation um, in any kind of project. Um, and um, and some practices had really engaged leadership and other practices didn't. Um, and lastly, change is hard. Um, that's, I think, something that um, everybody on this um, webinar is probably familiar with. Um, so in talking about the next steps, um, MassHealth, which is our Medicaid agency, uh, has, has developed a global payment model um, for a behavioral health integration. It greatly supports behavioral health integration in the primary care practice. And it incorporates um, the, um, the elements of integration and this toolkit in that um, there are going to be three tiers. Um, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of information that you can find on mass.gov, and I would encourage you to go look at it if you're interested. But I will say that there are different levels of tiers of behavioral health services that can be provided under the global payment as well as different levels of risk that practices can take depending on how comfortable they are with those services that they're able to provide. And it goes from everything from, uh, from
looks like Megan has uh, dropped off the phone, Daniel. If you want to take okay. a Yeah, I'll uh, I'll pick up. Um, she she's trying to get back on. So um, Me Megan was uh, talking uh, a bit about uh, where we think things are going with payment reform, um, and um, there will be uh, different levels of uh, reimbursement available. Um, depending on the level of integration that a practice is willing uh, to commit to. Uh, and again, also it looks like there's going to be different levels of risk that practices have to take on. Um, so I think the next bullet point here that uh, Megan was going to talk about was that the toolkit uh, will be publicly available for, for all practices to use. Um, it's not yet available, um, but um, the expectation is that it, it will be soon, uh, within the coming months. Uh, I, my understanding is that there has been approval to move it. It's just the process of actually moving it into a public space uh, for everyone uh, to view. So again, if you check back at the EO HHS uh, website, uh, or really, I think if you just Googled um, Massachusetts Behavioral Health Toolkit, you'd probably find it. Uh, I would encourage you to check back uh, next month uh, and see if uh, you're able to access it uh, without a password. Um, Hi, I'm I'm back. I'm so sorry. So Megan, I, I don't know if you could hear me while you were out, but um, I just let them know that the toolkit should become available within the next couple of months, uh, and uh, I just spoke a little bit more about the the payment model. Yeah, I'd actually say the next couple of days to weeks. It's um, we were a little bit delayed. It was supposed to be July first, so I'm expecting it to be any day now. Okay, uh, this is Neil Kirshner, uh, Megan, and Dan. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, and from the questions, uh, people really do want to um, have access to that tool. Uh, and it wasn't clear from your statement, will it be available for practices or individuals outside of Massachusetts, or will they need a, a password or something to get the tool? Um, it will be available publicly to anyone without a password in just a number of days to weeks. Um, please feel free to email me um, maybe in a week or two, and I can let you know if there's a link. But on mass.gov, the Executive Office of Health and Human Services Agency is the expected place for the website. Um, and so you can check that um, as well. But I really do expect it to be very soon. That's wonderful. Um, as I said, a number of people are very impressed. They also had a question uh, about uh, will there be any updates to the toolkit or are any updates planned? Um, there will be a process for updating the toolkit on a routine basis, perhaps six months to, a, to an annual basis, um, but some of those details have not been worked out yet, but that's the intention. And then there were some questions, and this I think goes to the, the uh, PCPCC organizers. Will the slides for this presentation be available? The slides will be available within 24 hours after this webinar. Wonderful. And those will be available on the, uh, on the website? That is correct. Great. And there, I, I see there's another question too is can can you notify us when this is when the toolkit is available and we'll put a link to it on our website once once we see it's available. Oh, that's a great idea. We'd be happy to um, let you know so that it can be um, put on your website. Please do. Thank you. Uh, it, it is a, a really good format to help um, practices do the type of transformation they really need, need to do. And, uh, it's just very encouraging work. Um, there was a question, another question concerning the, uh, the assessment tool, uh, and it, that was how long did it take for it, how long does it take for someone to complete it on, in general? My, Ed, why don't you answer that question? Yeah, I, my memory is that it took less than 30 minutes. I think that's really going to depend on who's in your group and if there's a group of people taking it and how much they want to talk about it. Um, for an individual to sit down and click through and respond, I, I would think 15 minutes. Um, if, if you really want to use it as a launching point for broader discussions, um, you know, you could easily spend an hour, uh, hour and a half uh, going through it. Um, I think it depends a little bit on, on how you approach it, but in terms of just clicking, uh, no more than 15 minutes, uh, for sure. 
and again, somewhat related, uh, questions related to uh, do you have any knowledge of practices that just use the toolkit uh, without the help of the, uh, the medical home facilitators? And if there were such practices, what were the impressions of the ability of the toolkit alone to uh, effectively help the practices transform? You know, we don't have that sort of level of data. I do know, well, l let me first say, um, the toolkit and transformation hopefully go hand in hand, but the toolkit hasn't been out long enough for true, trans tr true transformation to have taken place. Um, we use the medical home facilitators to sort of promote and prompt practices. I do know, but that may, may have been because I promoted it with a couple of practices that I knew um, and that I worked with closely to say, it's available, go check it out, let us know what you think. Um, and so I, I can't say whether um, the medical home facilitators versus the non-medical home facilitator practices uh, use the toolkit in any different way. And which leads to questions about those uh, medical home facilitators. I, I assume they were paid for by the grant. Is that true? Um, the, the, this is a statewide initiative, so there was the funding from the state, and uh, they were they are paid by the state for this. Yeah. Okay, which which the follow-up questions uh, that were um, asked were, uh, what were their roles? How were their roles described to them? And what were the um, uh, credentials of these um, facilitators. Sure. Uh, Dan, do you want to take this or do you want me to take a shot yeah. at it? No, let me take the first shot and then you can pick up the pieces. Uh, so uh, the, uh, um, my memory is uh, they were all, they all had master's degrees. Uh, it varied what those were in. I think there were some public health, uh, certainly some nursing, um, some, I think uh, there was one or more social work. Uh, so I think the, you know, the degree probably that the person had probably doesn't tell you very much about their qualifications uh, to do this. It probably had, it, it had a lot more to do with their background. Uh, so certainly anyone that had prior experience working as a facilitator uh, in one of the projects uh, that have been happening over the last years. Um, and, uh, um, in terms of their role, I, I don't think I would be purely speculating about like what the text of their job description was. It's just beyond the scope of, of what I know about the project. I mean, I could tell you from being in one of the practices uh, that was in the project, their role certainly changed over the course of the three years. Initially, there were a lot of there was a lot of data that the practices had to deliver. Uh, as part of being in the project and initially um, the facilitators were really being asked to, to, to push the practices hard to deliver that data. Uh, I would say that that in some cases led to challenging relationships between the facilitators and the practices and that um, once the facilitators were freed up to actually uh, sit down with the practices and help them identify their own goals uh, in terms of transformation, that the the quality of those relationships got better. Uh, so, you know, maybe to say that more clearly, uh, when they were just taskmasters going in to sort of enforce requirements of the project, I don't think the facilitators were particularly effective. And I think uh, a little bit into the project, it seemed as if their role shifted, uh, and it, they were much more collaborative in being allowed to help the practices set goals. Uh, and, and work on those goals and help them solve problems or to exchange information uh, between one of the practices the facilitators was working with and a different uh, practice that the facilitator might be working with. All right, thank you. Uh, and another direction, and, uh, and is it, it's not directly related, but perhaps you can comment on it. Uh, do you have anything you can, you can say about differences in patient perceptions or comfort, le comfort levels when receiving the um, behavioral health screens either or services uh, in a co-located or non-co-located practice? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I could talk, I, I could talk about that from my own experience. Um, 
although I think there's a little bit of a selection bias. You know, I work in primary care and I'm a behavioral health clinician. The patients who come and meet with me tend to be thrilled uh, that they can access behavioral health services and are thrilled that me and their PCP are exchanging information um, and that they can conveniently uh, get all their needs met in one place. Um, that said, there, there, there's, there's still definitely a place for non-co-located care uh, and some patients will choose to seek their care in those settings, but I don't see those patients, so it's hard for me to comment on that. Um, uh, but I, I know some of them are out there. Um, I think what's important is, is making sure that the patients have a choice and uh, I will say that sometimes uh, part of my role is briefly meeting with a patient and helping them navigate the mental health system to identify a provider who is not co-located uh, and help them jump through all the, the hoops and understand all the requirements uh, so that they can actually get through the door of a mental health clinic or uh, find a private practitioner uh, who's available to meet with them. And, and oftentimes that's the role that the integrated behavioral health consultant plays. Um, so I, I, that, that I would all characterize that as sort of anecdotal evidence. I don't have, we don't have survey data uh, or anything of higher quality that could, that could tell you what that satisfaction is. But people certainly speak with their feet and uh, there seems to be a never-ending demand for uh, integrated behavioral health services amongst our patients. All right, we have several um, perhaps can be called politically sensitive questions, but why not? Um, would either one of you have anything to say about the clinical team and different roles that members should play uh, in terms of um, the, uh, the physician and the um, behavioral health specialist and perhaps less credentialed members of the team uh, and um, anything along those lines that you, you would like to say. So uh, I will, I'll jump in here um, actually because the, um, the legislature just commissioned the Department of Mental Health to convene a behavioral health integration task force um, to address some of these issues in Massachusetts, and that report is forthcoming as well. Um, you could probably find it on the Department of Mental Health website in the next several days as well. Um, but um, there was a lot of debate among behavioral health providers and primary care providers about the best use of the entire workforce, and there was without a doubt agreement that um, peers um, and, and family supporters and patient advocates could be part of the care in some way or another, and that um, care can be provided by a variety of different individuals. There was some concern about um, uh, perhaps um, changing scope of um, practice to allow particular um, clinical individuals to expand their scope of services. Um, and so we sort of steered away from that issue, if, if that's sort of where you're meaning in terms of the political sensitivity of this. But without a doubt, um, peer, su peer support specialists um, and persons with lived experience were certainly um, promoted among this group. That though, however, I don't know how that translated or how it was or how it is being used within the actual 45 practices that are participating in our medical home initiative. Yeah, and, and I can add to that uh, a little bit uh, and say um, I think one of the things that we noticed recently is we probably didn't, we, we didn't do a very good job of talking about the role that a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse might uh, play on the team. And that isn't a, something that's prominently described in the toolkit and that's certainly an oversight uh, that ought to be addressed. Uh, because because there definitely is really good evidence around impact model and, and others for leveraging a, a, a psychiatrist time uh, in primary care. Um, and certainly one of the issues there is how do you help to train a psychiatrist for that role? Um, you don't want the psychiatrist coming into primary care and just setting up shop in the same way that they do it would in a department of psychiatry. Um, they'll be overwhelmed uh, with patients too quickly. Um, how do you use their time as a consultant? Um, I will say that it, it looks like in the payment reform project that will be happening in, in Massachusetts that there will definitely be a, a place for practices that have uh, 
say for example a day a week of a psychiatrist's time uh, there will be there appears like there will be real financial incentives uh, to using a psychiatrist in that uh, consultative fashion. Um, in terms of other team members and some of the other questions I see here, um, you know, the question of psychologists versus social workers versus other providers, I think, you know, the, the toolkit doesn't take a, a particularly strong position on that. Um, I think a lot of the, that is going to depend on the financial realities of, of clinics and uh, and what they see as their need. Um, I think there's definitely a place for both. Um, I know in my own clinic, as we begin to think about how do we increase our depression care management and all the other kinds of care management activities that, that ought to be happening with behavioral health integration, we're thinking, you know what, a social worker probably has better skills at doing that work than our psychologists and so the next member of our team uh, in the clinic I'm in will be a social worker because we think they, they have a little bit more varied skills than uh, uh, that aren't exactly the skills that the psychologists have. Um, in terms of some of the other questions I'm seeing about different team members, um, uh, just to clarify, um, uh, medical assistants or RNs administer uh, don't verbally administer uh, our screeners. Um, they provide the patients the screener in writing, uh, and the patients complete that in the exam room. Um, we're continuously trying to, to push our RNs and medical assistants to become more active in patients and not just be the person who rooms them and does immunizations, um, but that's, that's ongoing uh, work. Um, one other question I see about different roles is PCPs providing behavioral health care. Um, you know, PCPs are always counseling the patients. Uh, the question is whether or not they're, they're using evidence-based counseling approaches. Um, and uh, I think there will always be a place for PCPs to be counseling their patients. That doesn't mean they'll, they'll be providing psychotherapy, um, but they're certainly going to be uh, counseling their patients. and and we think that the toolkit sort of reinforces that everyone has some, every member of the team has some role to play uh, in uh, behavioral health uh, uh, work. All right, well, we're getting close to the time we need to stop. I guess the last question, if you uh, want to comment on it, there were several questions, again, looking at the um, financing of um, behavioral health integration. And you mentioned what maybe coming down the pike in Massachusetts, but more generally, do you have any comments you'd like to make about how this type of, these type of services can be financially integrated into uh, health care? Um, small question like that. Yeah, yeah, solve payment issues in three minutes. Um, so I, I think we're excited to see that there's movement towards per member per month payments and that practices will be uh, asked to decide how they want to use that money to effectively care for their patients. Um, ultimately, I think that that just changes everything. Uh, and you know, if we want to be keeping patients out of the emergency room, out of the hospital, um, many, many of those patients uh, need to be engaged to help them change their behavior. Uh, and if you want to help someone change their behavior, you ought to have a behavioral health provider on the team. Uh, and so I think that, for me, that that's really the, the holy grail. Um, in the meantime, you know, a lot of practices have worked uh, to use um, uh, the health behavior codes, CPT codes, to try to expand the roles uh, that their providers, uh, can, that their psychologists or social workers can play. You know, the ability to do that varies pretty greatly by state and sometimes even within states, uh, depending on your practice location. Um, short of that, um, we're, you're, most people are really in an RVU model, and um, there it's just um, trying to find ways to balance making your clinicians productive while simultaneously making them available for new patients. Um, and that's where I'm really excited by this open access model that, we, that we've experimented with in the last year uh, that's allowed us to increase our utilization rate and decrease the wait times uh, for new patients to come in. Um, I think you did very well, Dan, on a very difficult question in a very brief period of time. We're coming to the end of our webinar. I want to thank 
uh, both Megan and Dan for just a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And the toolkit, uh, I hope, will be uh, obtained and, and used by, by many, many others. Just a reminder that on July 30th, um, the PCPCC will be presenting a uh, webinar on the Colorado Experiment Primary Care and Behavioral Health. Uh, and again, the slides will be available on the PCPCC website. So thank you for joining us, and uh, may the rest of your day be wonderful. <laughs>